start sharing the screen yeah one second sir i'll do that like right now sir Okay, am I audible and visible? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yes. Okay. okay. So now that uh, you guys know, not visible, audible only. Okay. You start the start the first slide. Yeah. So now that you know how to see the patient, examine the patient, you have seen the X-rays, uh, you have ordered the implants, and you have done pre-surgical optimization. and it's time to take the incision but before you take the incision you have to make an important decision of choosing the correct surgical approach to the knee so i have divided the topic into four sub topics we'll start with relevant anatomy followed by standard surgical approaches for the tkr that we use for uh, simple primary knees then extended approaches for tkr which we use for complex primary and revision scenarios and a few slides on minimally invasive approaches for tkr all the references are mentioned at the bottom of the slides which you can refer if you want to read further about them so let's start with the relevant anatomy now we all know that the quadriceps musculature is formed one second is formed by the vastus lateralis on the lateral side the rectus femoris and intermedius in the center and vastus medialis on the medial side all these form the quadriceps tendon in the center is the patella patella is attached to the tibial tuberosity with the patella tendon now on the medial side at the junction of the middle one third and the distal one third on the medial side somewhere here lies the uh, subsartorial canal or the hunter's canal it is mainly formed by vastus medialis sartorius adductor magnus and longus and that contains femoral artery vein saphenous nerve and nerve to vmo now although we are all orthopedic surgeons and we deal with the hard bones but we must be respectable to the skin especially in a case of the knee because knee is a very superficial joint with superficial bones like patella and tibial tuberosity so if there is any injury uh, or skin dehiscence or infection that can lead to exposure of the implants or the bones und underneath so uh, the problem with the epidermis is is that it does not have its individual blood supply it receives its blood supply from diffusion through the muscles and above the fascia there is anastomosis of the artery and the veins so whenever we are making flaps they should be thick and deep to the fascia one more important point is the blood supply to the skin comes mainly from the medial side that also we should know now it has been seen by a lot of researchers that after one year follow up and after 10 year follow up lot of patients have unexplained anterior knee pain so when they started researching about it that why the patient are having those knee pain they found out that avascular necrosis of the patella could be one of the reasons so let's look at the blood supply to the patella it's mainly formed by supreme genicular artery medial superior medial inferior genicular artery lateral superior and lateral inferior genicular artery and they form anastomosis around the patella now whenever we do medial parapatellar approach we can injure these arteries which could lead to avian of the patella whenever we remove the infra patellar fat pad that can injure medial inferior genicular arteries whenever we remove the lateral meniscus and if we don't Uh, leave a cuff there that can lead to lateral inferior genicular artery injury and whenever some retinacular lateral retinacular release is done it can lead to injury of the lateral superior genicular arteries so coming to the standard surgical approaches first we'll read about the anterior skin incision so most commonly we use anterior midline skin incision some researchers have said that if we go a little medial we will be more parallel to the langer's line if we are more parallel there is less tension and that will lead to better healing better scarring and faster healing 
but if we are going more medial that means we are leaving a large lateral skin flap and that is poorly perfused so we should stick to the anterior center midline incision only now if previous multiple incisions are there over the skin then we should use the lateral most incision if uh, in poor host or patients with previous surgery we should make a take a more liberal incision by poor host i mean patients who are on steroids who are immunocompromised who are smokers who are rheumatoid arthritis patient in those patients we should take a bigger liberal incision so that there is less traction uh, retraction on the skin if old incisions are present we should not uh cross it acutely we should be at at least we try we should try to be at 90 degrees to them if two incisions are there we should try to keep a bridge of at least 5 to 6 cm and when we are taking incision the edges the, the ends of the incision should be like a v instead of a u now uh before taking the incision we flex the knee and we mark the patella and the tubal tuberosity the incision goes 5 to 6 cm above to the patella depending upon the girth of the thigh and it ends 1 cm below and medial to the tibial tuberosity incision is taken always in flexion because when you flex the knee the subcutaneous tissue will fall medially and laterally which improves the exposure the nerve at risk here is infrapatellar branch of the saphenous nerve this can lead to painful neuromas or decrease sensation over the over the medial part of the knee these are very superficial and thin uh, nerves in case you are able to see them you should resect it and you should bury it in the into the fat because this reduces the chances of painful neuromas now that we have taken the incision we will go into arthrotomy arthrotomy is basically basically opening up the joint now the most commonly done approach is medial parapatellar approach okay first we take the mid the midline skin incision then we make a bit uh, medial skin thick flaps are made so that we are able to see the quadriceps tendon the patella the retinaculum and the patellar tendon now incision is taken in the middle of the uh, midline of the quadriceps tendon we go medial to the patella we should leave a cuff of at least 1 cm medial to the patella this helps in easy closure as well as it protects the anastomosis of blood supply around the patella and we should end the incision 1 cm medial to the tibial tuberosity now in deeper uh, dissection we can extend the knee we can subluxate the patella and then flex the knee to expose the joint in case you are not able to expose the joint properly that means the incision is small then you should feel for the tight structures they will be either proximal or distal based on that you can extend your incision now hofa fat pad is somewhere here which is basically infra patella fat pad it should be incompletely removed because uh, if you remove it completely unnecessarily it can lead to injury of the inferior blood vessels so this is a video so first you palpate the shin of the tibia and you mark the tibial tuberosity so here we are marking the patella and we are marking the tibial tuberosity now the incision will go in the center of the patella and will end 1 cm medial to the tip of the tibial tuberosity now marking the incision here which will help us in the closure now see the thumb is on the tibial tuberosity and we are taking an incision and we make sure that we are 1 cm medial to the tibial tuberosity then we change the skin knife we take a new knife and we'll go down until we start seeing the glistening white patella tendon at the bottom and quadriceps tendon at the top with the help of the fingers you can spread the incision so that you are able to see the structures properly now we are cutting the deep fascia by changing the direction of the scalpel and now we can see the quadriceps tendon you can use mop now here we are making medial skin flaps they are thick it can be done either in extension or in flexion the scalpel should be tilted at around 45 degrees now we can see the vastus medialis 
now the finger is so, on Vimal, the... which 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 layer are you dividing sorry which layer are you dividing you are below the dermis so that's what they should understand yeah yeah yes right? you through the, the fat yes yes yeah so problem comes is if if you're too superficial and you go through epidermis and dermis yes sir we have to be under the dermis uh then we are marking the tibial tuberosity again 1 cm medial to the tuberosity we have marked distally proximally we have marked the quadriceps tendon now we start taking incision we have to be in the center of the quadriceps tendon or slightly medial to the center we are we are palpating the patella we are leaving a cuff of around 1 cm medial to the patella we are keeping the finger on the tuberosity and we are completing our arthrotomy now the arthrotomy can be completed in either in extension or as in this case we are, would achieve the full arthrotomy in flexion itself and yeah, the three common is, common mistakes that i usually see is uh, you are too deep or too center into your quadriceps tendon okay so all that you need is a small cuff for suturing back the more middle or lateral you are you are causing more weakness of your quadriceps tendon second thing is uh, when you early in your uh, uh, surgeries you don't leave a cuff so that suturing becomes a problem and third mistake very common is you again don't leave a cuff near the medial uh, tubercle the tuberosity so take a good 1 uh, cm flap so that it's easy for you to suture yes so now as you have seen this is a most commonly done approach it is very easy to learn and reproduce it provides very good exposure in all types of tkr that is simple primary complex primary as well as revision tkrs the very easy dislocation inversion of patella is possible and a lot of long term studies has been done and they have yielded excellent and reproducible results the problem with this approach is as we just read when we do a medial parapatellar approach we can it can lead to injury to the superomedial and inferior medial genicular artery and in theory it can cause patellar avn now since we are cutting into the uh, attachment of the vastus muscles it can lead to patellar instability and maltracking and since we are cutting into the quadriceps tendon it can lead to delay in the rehabilitation and more post op pain so in order to deal with these disadvantages came the next subvastus approach now as the uh, name suggest we are going subvastus that is below the vastus medialis muscle the midline incision remains fairly similar to the medial parapatellar here also we make a big uh, medial subcutaneous flap the belly of the vastus medialis is completely visualized now the inferior margin of the vastus medialis is either bluntly dissected or incised of the intermuscular septum then with the finger you can go deep to the vastus medialis and do clearance by clearance i mean whatever facial attachments are there either superficial or deep that is released so if you see here this is the vastus medialis this is the patella which has been marked tibial tuberosity will be somewhere here so our arthrotomy line will go inferior to the vastus medialis till the patella and from the patella it will be similar to the medial parapatellar approach so after we have done the flap if you see here inverted l shape shaped capsulotomy is done with the horizontal margin below the subvastus and then we go to the patella and down so after we have done the capsulotomy you uh, do in, uh, you make the knee in extension whatever supra patellar pouch adhesions are there th those are removed and in extension patella is subluxated laterally you put the homan retractors to subluxate the patella and then the knee is flexed and the joint is exposed this is the video for that the thumb is on the tibial tuberosity and we are taking midline incision it could be slightly medial uh, we are going deep now we are making the medial flap we are taking which is very deep to expose the vastus medialis we are cutting the fascia here with scissors the attachments now we can see the vastus medialis here so then we will mark that is the patella 
This is the attachment of the mastus medialis on the superior medial patella. We are marking the inferior margin of the sub of the vastus medialis attachment on the patella. We are doing the capsulotomy now. Once the incision is taken, you can uh, put your finger inside and you can release the adhesions there. We are completing the capsulotomy right now. This is what I was saying. You can put the finger and you can increase it. You can do the clearance. Whatever adhesions are there, you can be removed. Make sure you don't go more than seven to eight centimeter because Hunter's canal is there. So you have to be uh, careful about that. Now that is the suprapatellar pouch synovium, which is there. So now we are removing that. Once it is completely removed, you will start seeing the femur. Some part of the Hofa's fat pad is being removed here then. Yeah, so essentially the tethering of the quadriceps superior and above uh, towards the skin and underneath the suprapatellar pouch and the lateral intermuscular center, uh, the medial uh, septum. So here uh, we are releasing it even further down. Yeah. And then a lot of it is also blunt dissection. So now I'm checking whether inferiorly and superiorly I'm free. So once you see that, you can see now the patella is on the, uh, it's moved onto the uh, lateral side. Lateral so side. that means the exposure is adequate. It's complete. Yeah. So this is how we do the sub <coughs> approach. Now, early rehabilitation has been seen because we are not cutting into the quadriceps muscle. Patient are able to do early independent straight leg raising. The range of motion is very good. Now, patellar vascularity is preserved because we are not cutting into the vastus medialis. There is less post-op pain, which leads to reduction in analgesia requirement, which leads to decreased hospital length of stay. Now, since we are not cutting into the attachment of the vastus medialis, patellar maltracking is, is not seen, and that is why there is no need for a lateral release. Some disadvantages are that patella can be difficult to evert or subluxate laterally. If you go too deep into the towards the hunter's canal, we can lead to the injury of the vessels there. And it has been uh, given in all the standard books that it is difficult to do in obese patients, those patients who have a thigh girth of more than 55 centimeter, in muscular patient, in patients with stiff knees, in revision scenarios, and valgus. Now, if you ask me, should we do it in these patients? I would say no. But if you ask me, has it been done? Yes, it has been done by a few surgeons in obese patients. Dr. Nilen Shah has actually done a minimally invasive subvastus in those patients. In 110 patients he has seen and the paper says that you can do it easily. But then you require a lot of experience to do it. So it's not recommended to do in these patients. Yeah. So two other categories you should stay away is uh, muscular men um, because the quadriceps is so big for you to move it to the lateral side is not easy and third is uh, even here you can see in the picture how the vmo attaches onto the patella um, anatomy wise they're divided into type 1 type 2 type 3 type 3 is where the vmo attaches in the lower half of the patella also so those cases are very difficult to handle so if you see the VMO is coming way down and attaching onto the patella, uh, those are the cases you should be away. And then again, uh, short uh, obese women and uh, men who are really muscular. So those are the ones you should stay away trying to do subvastus approach. And typically your skin incision is much longer than a medial parapatellar arthrotomy. And the other disadvantage is uh, the ecchymosis that patients have on the medial side after surgery because there is no yet there is no watertight closure in these patients you come to a point onto the medial aspect and suture beyond which the vmo just falls back onto the femur and there is that gap from which uh, the uh, post operatively you can have ecchymosis so it is important that you tell your patients that ecchymosis is possible and they should not be alarmed uh, post subvastus yeah so now we come to the mid approach. This is somewhere a compromise between the medial parapatellar 
approach because there we are cutting directly into the tendon but with very good exposure in mid vastus we are not cutting directly into the tendon but the exposure is better than sub vastus so the initially uh, the incision remains fairly similar in all cases straight midline incision with then medial subcutaneous flap is raised now the vastus medialis is identified and as the name suggests we are going mid vastus that is if this is the vastus medialis muscle we are going exactly in the center so around 5 to 6 cm long incision is taken parallel to the fibers of the vastus medialis the incision extended to the superior medial corner of the patella same as medial parapatella and then we go down and we end 1 cm medial to the tibial tubercle then similar to sub vastus the capsule of the supra patellar pouch is divided so that the patella can be subluxated so this is the video we start with the uh, midline incision now here we are we are able to see the vastus medialis slowly we will start raising the flap medially so that is the big vastus medialis muscle we can see on the medial we are releasing the flap adhesions we are removing now the it, we have marked the vastus medialis the patella and the tibial tuberosity we are starting with the capsulotomy and then we are 5 to 6 cm the belly of the muscle we are going deep to the bone now we are will extend the knee and we see here we are able to see the femur but supra patellar pouch and ovum is still there so we will remove first we are removing the infra patellar fat pad this is the anterior medial release that we are doing so mid vastus is a good compromise between medial parapatellar and sub vastus uh, no contraindications as such most of uh, the patients you can get away doing it unless it's a complex knee uh again you can get air tight closure water tight closure because you can go to the edge and suture but the disadvantage is as you go through the surgery you're not mindful of uh, of the extent to which it can go so sometimes it does extend backwards so you'll have to find that edge and suture so in in all minimally invasive procedures the idea is for the patella to uh, come and uh, sit in the lateral gutter like how we are showing here and then you put your retractor and flex and if you can see the superior edge of uh, the femur then your exposure is done yeah so uh, uh, the advantage is it is a very good uh, it is better exposure and easier to avert the patella compared to sub vastus there is rapid restoration of the extensor mechanism because essentially we are not cutting into the vastus medialis insertion on the quadriceps tendon there is less post op pain which leads to less analgesia and decrease hospital length of stay now the disadvantage as sir said we are cutting into the vastus medialis muscle which can lead to hematoma formation and skin ecchymosis in post op period now the supreme genicular artery is present in the belly of the vastus medialis so it has been in theory it has been said that it can lead to patellar avn and compared to medial parapatellar it can be difficult for a few surgeons in obese and muscular patients and in revision scenarios but fairly it's a very good approach so a lot of study has been done to compare sub vastus and mid vastus most of them have shown that there are there are no significant difference when it comes to post op pain uh, knee society score quadriceps emg data peak muscle talk lateral release requirement component placement alignment uh but few studies have said that sub vastus uh, there is less blood loss and early active slr and in mid vastus there is shorter operative time probably because the exposure is easier so coming to the lateral parapatellar approach we'll read about it later when in, when we have a lecture on valgus knees but i'll just tell you the important points regarding the lateral parapatellar approach 
it is similar to medial parapetalar except here instead of going medial we are going more lateral on the patella and one important thing here is that we do a z plasty of the patellar lateral retinaculum uh, capsule complex so basically what we do here is when the lateral retinaculum we do undermining dissection where it is separated into superficial and deep layers how uh, we have shown in the video so that is the superficial layer and this one is the deep layer now we are opening the synovium to expose the joint and when the closure is done then the lateral edge of the patellar retinaculum is closed with the medial edge of the synovium okay this is called z plasty this ensures that there is relaxation of the retina uh, lateral retinaculum uh, the other important thing is the hofa fat pad must be attached laterally because it helps in the closure uh, this photograph is done in the in campbell they have shown the same thing uh, z plasty of the lateral retinaculum capsule complex now the advantage is it is mainly uh, used in fixed moderate to severe valgus deformity cases there is less need for any additional lateral patellar release and easier to address the tight lateral structures in valgus knees the disadvantage is it is less commonly done it is relatively difficult to evert the patella and high chances of skin necrosis is present so studies has been done and it has been shown that 80% of the mild uh, of the valgus knees are mild by mild i mean less than 10 degree valgus and uh, when we compare lateral approach to medial approach there is no significant difference however when we see severe valgus knees in that case lateral approach has shown to be better than medial approach in fixed valgus knee deformities it is easier uh, release of the lateral structures better knee joint visualization better patella tracking since we are releasing less we can get away with less constrained implants uh, however there is a longer learning curve and soft tissue closure can be little difficult in lateral approaches now we come to the extended approach for tkr basically we use these approaches for complex primary or revision scenarios now quadriceps snip is the most commonly done approach it yields excellent soft tissue exposure so we start with the standard medial parapatellar approach and then at the apex we go at an angle of 45 degree in the direction of the vastus lateralis parallel to the direction of the vastus lateralis or you can just go 3 to 4 cm above the patella and cut at an angle of 45 degree towards the vastus lateralis both can be done in this video uh, yeah, we have they have shown how to do it first medial parapatellar approach is taken then measurement is done 4 to 5 cm above the patella quadriceps tendon is marked then at the angle of 45 degree using a cautery full thickness quadriceps tendon is cut this provides excellent exposure and there is no compromise functionally and there is no change in post op physiotherapy protocol after a quadriceps snip provided it has been sutured well now quadriceps turn down is there rarely done nowadays where above one 1 cm above the patella the quadriceps tendon is split into in, in the middle one goes medial one goes lateral you go along the patella and towards the patella tendon in both the direction and uh, this this allows complete exposure of the joint but it is rarely done now it was modified later where we first do a standard medial parapatellar approach and instead of going 45 degree up we go 45 degree down towards the vastus lateralis muscle but it can lead to injury to the inferior lateral geniculate arteries again it is modified further how do you, how do you decide between both no? between a snip and a quadriceps plasty so most of the time <coughs> yeah so so yeah go ahead no tell, tell sir it's okay sir you go ahead sir no so both have very uh, different indications that we need to understand and we cannot convert one to the other once you're committed to a snip you're committed to a snip you can't then do a turn down right so if your quadriceps uh is tethered on to the femur 
and the issue is uh, really contracted quadriceps, then the turn down plasty helps. If you're only looking at a fairly normal quadriceps muscle, which is not contracted and tethered, but you want exposure for your primary or a revision case, then a SNP works. So how, what is the pathology in the quadriceps is very important. If you feel we have a lot of these young guys who come 10 years after multiple surgeries. So there you have so much tethering of the quadriceps. If you do a SNP, nothing happens. There you want lengthening of the quadriceps for you to gain range of motion in these patients because flexing the knee is the problem because you will do the surgery, you will put your implant, you still have such tightness of your quadriceps that these patients won't have flexion. So there, uh, VY plastic really helps. Yeah. If you want only exposure turned out, just the SNP works. Yes. So as I just mentioned, when there are stiff knees, and we need to lengthen the quadriceps, then modified VY plasty is done. Here, after taking a, a medial parapetalar approach, we take an inverted V across the quadriceps tendon. Now, during the closure, what we do is we pull down the patella and the quadriceps down and we close in a VY fashion. So basically, it means the V is converted into a Y. So here, if you are pulling the patella and the quadriceps musculature down, we first start closing here and then we close on the, onto the limbs. What it does is it helps in lengthening of the quadriceps tendon in stiff knees. So that way it's very good. Now compared to the medial parapatellar TKA patients, the extensor mechanism becomes a little weaker because we are lengthening it, but not to a significant degree. Uh, we do tell these patients you'll have 20, 20% 20 lag. Yeah, extension lag can be there in post-op period. That should be informed to the patient. Uh, the next one is tibial tubercle osteotomy. Here, uh, we take a long incision. We extend the incision 8 to 10 centimeter below the tibial tubercle. The medial parapatellar ap approach again is extended down 8 to 10 centimeter below the tibial tubercle. When, then with the use of drill oscillating saw and osteotomes, the whole tibial crest is elevated but we make sure that the lateral periosteum and the quadriceps mechanism are left attached. And later, the tubercle can be re using multiple wires or screws. Now, a few slides on minimally invasive approaches. Now, one thing we have to know that minimally invasive TKR does not mean smaller incision. Smaller incision is just a part of the whole minimally invasive approaches. The primary objective of MIS is to reduce injury to the soft tissues be it quadriceps muscle, be it synovium, fat pad, everything. And component position, ligament balancing, and overall limb alignment must not be compromised. Now, with the modification of TKR instrumentation, navigation, and robotics, we can achieve sufficient necessary exposure without excessive, excessive traction. And a lot of studies have been done, and they have shown that uh, these less invasive surgery can cause reduced blood loss, reduced pain in post-op period. There is less morbidity and faster recovery. Now, appropriate patient selection is very important. According to standard books, they say the patient should be small to average stature. There should be less deformity with good range of motion in pre-op period. The types of limited medial parapatella, limited subvastus, midvastus, and quadriceps sparing. Now, the take-home message, if you go online and you start reading about all the approaches that are there and all the uh, articles that have been published, you will end up in a situation like this. So, I'll make it very simple for you. Be very good with medial parapatella and quadriceps snip. You will, based on my experience, you will be able to do 99.9% .9 of the cases. Of The consultants here will give their opinion, but this is what I feel. If you are able to do these two things properly, you will be able to do most of the TKRs. Thank you and all the best. Yeah, only f there are four criteria for an MIS approach, right? One is already mentioned a shorter incision. There is no, people are fixated on length. There's uh, nothing like that, uh, that it has to be 10 centimeters, 7.5, whatever. So it, usually it's a smaller. Second thing is, instead of everting the patella, you sublux the patella on into the lateral side. So that's the second criteria. 
third criteria is you don't go, go through the quadriceps uh, muscle so either it has to be a subvastus or a midvastus and the last thing is uh, you don't really uh, take off a lot of uh, uh, usually what we do is we clear out the suprapatellar pouch uh, completely we just make it bare uh, that can cause theoretically more bleeding more synovium formation later so mis part of mis is not to touch the suprapatellar pouch so it's the incision subluxing the patella not touching the quadriceps tendon and the suprapatellar pouch any questions uh, you have regarding approaches Anything in the chat, Kishore? Anything, anything about patellofemoral ligament? Yeah. So Someone sometimes when you're when you're yeah, sometimes when you're unable to sublux the patella on the side, you can just nick it. Usually it's it's quite flimsy, you can move it out. Uh, but if you require to release it, you can. It's not mandatory in every case. And patella osteoporosis. No, patella. So if <clears throat> so, if you are unable to get good exposure, and you have a big osteophyte around the patella, what we usually do is we prepare the patella to the Deep patelloplasty the patella. right away. So if it is coming in your way of your approach, uh, feel free to deal with the patella right away even before uh, you go through the other steps of surgery. That is always better. Debulk the patella and subluxate. The whole exposure... So I've gone through this whole... Yeah, go ahead. Yep. The whole exposure is in flexion. The whole exposure... You, some of the dissection you can do so in extension also. The medial flap when you are releasing, if you extend it, it will be easier. But easier it can be done to put the retractors also, home and retractors. Yeah. And the closer, so closer as well, about the closure, it also always in recommended flexion. inflection. Yeah, always, uh, always close in the position you've incised, right? If you yeah. suture your arthrotomy in extension, you will inadvertently tighten your flexion gap too much. Okay? So... Yes. After you start off the first three sutures that you normally put so that you have good tracking, after that, uh, it is better to suture uh, in the position you've actually done your incision. We have a, there's a question. Yeah. Is there any difficulty in visualizing anterior cortex of femur and subvastus or midvastus approach? So the problem with these two approaches is visualization of the tibia on the lateral side. Okay. Femur is not a big issue because as you flex, the whole femur is staring in front of you. Problem comes with these approaches is when you try to dislocate the tibia, uh, the whole quadriceps tendon with the patella and the, and the patella tendon are almost covering your lateral side of the tibia. So that's the reason in MIS approaches, there is a, there is a chance of mal rotating your tibial component, just like how in DAA, uh, there are issues with positioning of uh, the stem of the femur. Similarly, so the problem with these approaches is for you to get a hang of how to deal with the tibial preparation more than the femur. And it, it does take some time, at least 15 to 20 cases for you to understand how to tackle the lateral side. Any <clears throat> any tips for closure uh, during closure uh, so that it does not alter the patellar height? Does it happen uh, in 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 during closure uh, the MIS approaches? Yeah, in uh, the for beginners, it is the yeah, middle so pair of patellar. The, the best thing is to do is like how we showed you: take a marking pen. And then outline your uh, parapetalar arthrotomy, right? Because when you're closing, if you put those three horizontal lines, you yeah. just have to oppose them to those three. So that way you're not uh, uh, sliding up or down in terms of uh, the tissue tension. You'll get good tissue tension. So one good way in your initial cases is even your skin incision, use a marking pen. 
and then your arthrotomy also at least make three big horizontal uh, marking markers. Yeah, you, we use, usually do one on the quadriceps tendon, one at the near the patella, and one at the joint line, and then use and put sutures on these three areas so that they are nicely opposed. And one of the middle one on the joint line. Yes. Superomedial part yes. of the patella, you put a mark and close it. And your shape of the arthrotomy definitely will tell how to close that and mark the points and close it and uh, put the three knots and see the tracking. Yes. So there's a question about uh, Z plasty in lateral parapetalar approach. Lateral parapetalar approach. Okay. What is it? Lateral uh, parapetalar approach. So they, so if if like, can you see my hands? Okay. So if if I go go through the arthrotomy, I'm going through two layers, right? One is uh, the synovium, right? And one is the fascia. So normally we go through them, right through and go into the joint, right? In lateral parapetalar, we have to separate these two layers, okay? We open one layer from this edge. We open the other layer from this edge, right? And then when we suture, we suture them like this. So that's the Z-plasty. So when I when I give you the lecture on uh, pelvis, well, we'll nice. show you the video better. So essentially, this is what's happening. You open it from the edge of the patella, lift this flap up, go down, make an incision here. And then when you close them, you close them like this. So that's the whole concept. Sir, how much so and which part of fix How much? How much and which part uh, of infrapetalar pad to be excised? Clear, one line clear statement. Uh, I will be showing that in technique. Yes. yes. As, uh, how as, much much you have to remove? as much as needed. There's no specific amount. The main and idea of removing infrapetalar pad of fat is to see the lateral border. Border of the tibia. And the implantation for cementing, it should not come in the way. Yes. And you can put a home and retractor. The rest of the fat, fat will be uh, subluxated. Ma'am, patella you... tendon. What are the tips to prevent patella tendon aversion? Evolution. Yeah. Don't yeah. ever touch are... the patella. If we are finding any difficulty to evert the patella, what should be our... First Don't do never thing. ever the patella, <laughs> subluxate the patella and suppose if you have problem, you extend the incision proximally and see the tension. And uh, when you are dealing with rheumatoids and stiffness, you have to take care. So usually it's, uh, if you are not able to move it to the side, it is the tethering of the patella tendon onto the tibia, which is in the lower half. So you'll have to clear that area properly. And thickness of the patella also matters. So like debulk I told you, you try to debulk, remove all the osteophytes and then use your homen on the lateral side and then right above the tibial tuberosity where the patella actually, the tendon actually attaches. You have that triangle area. So you try, have to try to clear that out. Once you do that, the patella nicely falls onto the lateral side. Patella is not... So there's some question about... Retract. Patella has to be averted or not? Better to subluxate Not rather required than at all. Working. Not required. Because you'll create a lot of tension in that area. And then there was another question about cautery versus knife, right? So yes, sir. Uh, what setting you use the cautery is very important. Usually we hike it up to 70, 80. Uh, that creates a lot of inflammation and injury in your tissue. So I personally try to use the knife most of the time because the cut is much cleaner. The amount of inflammation that comes from the knife is definitely less. In cautery, you have two modes, both the quag as well as cut, right? So I use quag wherever I feel that there is, they will be bleeding later, right? So when I'm taking out the meniscus, I use quag. Uh, when I'm near the inferior edge, I use quag. Uh, the areas where you have vessels and you feel that they will be bleeding, use quag. Otherwise, use cut. So, personally, I prefer the knife. Uh, in US and all, when we when I used to, when I, in my fellowship, they had something called aquamantis, which is ultrasound-based uh, cautery. Uh, 
uh, which actually irrigates and causes cauterization. So since we don't have all that here, uh, stick to the knife, but knife you have to have very good control. So I think in your initial cases, I would suggest invest in a good cautery machine where your setting is around 40, 45, where you can use uh, cut most of the time, coagulation in the areas where you feel there might be bleeding, the suprapatella pouch, uh, in the inferiorly, as well as removing the minerals. Use the cautery. Hello, sir. Regarding sinoectomy, irrespective of either inflammatory or non-inflammatory, one question. And other question is about the drain. So should we remove... Yeah, uh, sinoectomy, uh, sinoectomy, again, I would only do as much as I need in terms of exposure. Uh, I'm definitely not in favor of removing the whole suprapatella pouch. So if I have to use a stylus to size my, my femur, I'll only remove that much. Okay. Uh, so more removal of cyanogen is not required. If not exposure is an issue, take it out. Okay. Means and in then remote drain, end, we can I think remote. even in, yes, uh, in drain, uh, I think even in the last class, we made it very clear. Uh, I think 95% of surgeons have done away with drain. Yes. The only caveat is before closure, you have to have good uh, hemostasis. If there is absolutely no bleeding at the end of your procedure, there is no reason for you to have a drain. So just before closure, after release of uh, the tunicate, make sure that you cauterize everything well. Wait for a few minutes to see there is absolutely no bleeding. Two areas where there is still bleeding is from the pin sites. There's nothing you can do about it. And sometimes there is still ooze from the, Bone ooze will from be the there. femur itself, from the side. So that is there, not a issue. And sometimes you have bleeding from the posterior aspect of uh, the knee. That is the reason it's a good practice to cement with your trial. And then once you release the tunicate, remove your trial. If you have any vessels bleeding from the posterior aspect, you can still catch them, cauterize them, remove any cement if there is, and then actually put your original insert. Sorry. So if you're concerned about bleeding, usually best practice is to cement with a trial in and then decide on your original insert and then work on the backside if required and then put your original insert. At what step to decide whether there's a need the... of cordyceps nip there? Any tricks? <laughs> Right away at the time of incision, right after incision, uh, as you're flexing the knee and you're unable to get lateral exposure, you're unable to subluxate your patella. But mind you, we are only talking about revision setting and maybe very difficult primaries. Uh, stay away from doing it in, in regular primary regular surgeries. Primary. It is not at all required. Uh, and if you feel there is a need to it, go do it right away. So right at the time of exposure. Does the use of tourniquet in some way uh, affect your uh, choice for exposure? Or does it make any difference? It does make a difference, sir. Especially uh, in uh, difficult cases where you have tethering of the quadriceps. So when you're putting the tourniquet, when your OT people are working on it, make sure that you pull the whole quadriceps down and then apply the tourniquet, right? so that you don't have that false uh, tightness that can happen. So that's the first tip. So as you're putting the tunique, make sure that you pull the whole muscle down and then put the tunique on. And in, in these difficult cases, uh, we really put a high tunique where it's right in the groin and I have the full femur uh, available for me if I have to do all these uh, uh, soft tissue uh, procedures on the quadriceps tendon. Can I ask one question, sir? Yes. Hello. Sir, uh, what, what, yeah, go ahead, sir. What, what's the choice of uh, suture material? Because we see a lot of variation. People are using number two, number one vitreal for uh, cordyceps, uh -huh. uh, suturing back the cordyceps. So, in our hospital, of... we use two. Number two. Number two. Number two. Okay. And what about snipe? Suppose you have done a quadriceps snipe. So is the same thing or you would like to use a, a fiber wire or something? Usually we use a ethibond uh, to 
Uh, Ethibond is used in both places. Ethibond can be used to clo close the snip. You can do a reverse Alcava uh, stitch there and then superimpose it with a running knot for the quadriceps. Now with the new technique, which Radian Morgan Jones has described for the TTO, tubercle osteotomy, which is less like a sliver of bone. Even there, all that we do is we use three uh, ethibond uh, sutures, pull it down and then tie it down. So it's the way the sutures are is it's number two and then number one and then one zero. Uh, so these are the three sutures that we use. Board, For arthrotomy board. closure, it's, it's number two. Hmm. Okay, and then the slightly thinner number one, we use it for uh, uh, the closure of the subcutaneous layer. And then the one fat, zero is close the fat also. Yeah, in very deep patients, we do that. Okay. Uh, and in then for your subcutaneous thin. closure, you use yeah. one zero. One zero as a running touching stroke. Run. Continuous. Yeah, and for for uh, quadriceps parapetalar arthrotomy, you would use just interrupted ones or interrupted and continuous both. We put at least five interrupted and make sure the tracking is very good, and then do a full running stitch top to bottom. Remember, when you go through quadriceps, you are weakening the muscle by thirty percent, right? And if your suturing is not good. Especially in that top area. So if this this is how thick the quadriceps is, make sure you have a good cuff, so that you nicely suture it uh, together, so that the integrity is maintained. If your suturing is not good, it's already losing strength. Then, and again, they are at a disadvantage of some lag. So their amount of physiotherapy becomes uh, exponentially more. Some people use the braided stitch. That is also fine. We also use that. But it like came like a fad and then it went off. Uh, especially in large centers where you're pressed for time, maybe you can use not less sutures. Otherwise, it's not at all required. Thank you, sir. So my doubt about the patellar reversion is not still very clear because the books uh, which have been mentioned by us to follow, by you to follow us, in both the books, uh, uh, it has been mentioned that patella is reverted. Uh, Though there yes. is, uh, at, at uh, one place it is mentioned if we do not... Uh, Evert the patella, we just retract it. There is a, a better yes. vascular supply to the patella. So whether for us in the for us uh, the beginner people, what do you advise? Yeah. Whether we should go for reversion or just uh, we, the lateral retraction so, subluxation is so a lot of parts of insole and squat haven't been revived, right? Uh, all those initial chapters have almost remained the same for as long as I remember. Yes. Uh, Purely even the, the even, Scott, Richard Scott book, they're, they're mentioning yes, that. Yeah, so Insert and Scott, both because that's how they practiced and they believed in it, right? But I haven't seen anybody evert a patella in the last five years in, in so many surgeries, especially because it is not required. When, you're, when your incisions are nice and large, like beyond 20 centimeters, then you can easily evert the patella, not a big deal, Okay. There is this constant conflict in your mind between length of incision and, and how soft tissue is handled. So please remember the more, more liberal the incision, the less amount of retraction yes. you actually have to do. Yes. So that's why MIS uh, became uh, famous and then died down because incision started becoming smaller, but the amount of retraction became more, right? Ended up causing same amount of inflammation and pain in these patients. So I would say take a liberal incision and then subluxate the <laughs> patella. Again, you want to do it for exposure, right? Yes. Yeah. And then the chances of uh, uh, tendon injury, avulsion, everything is more high in everting because what you do is you evert in extension, then you flex the knee. Uh, you can never evert the patella in flexion, but you can subluxate the patella in flexion. So it is definitely less traumatic for the patient. Uh, especially in rheumatoid and where you have a lot of osteopenic patients, there is even chances of uh, uh, injury to the tendon. If it you so and then some surgeons even put a pin on the patella. It does nothing. Uh, it will just give you a false sense of assurance that you're trying to protect the tendon. But uh, how, you, how you retract is very important, especially your assistant. If somebody is over-enthusiastic... Yes. 
about the degree of difficulty in exposure getting exposure between these two eversion and retraction mm -hmm. degree of difficulty in further exposure and further surgery so is it the uh, same obviously if you have a if you have a larger incision and you evert everything opens like a book you can see yes. everything so when you are subluxing obviously your visualization is slightly less but it's a worthy compromise uh, yes. as far as exposure versus eversion in, in so subluxation. beginners also they should also practice subluxation yes. subluxation yeah. is always yeah. safe is yes, always safe and easy also easy also thank you any tips for anterior subluxation of tibia sir for uh, tibial preparation yeah uh, kishore you have a video on that pardon on that on which and we have a video on of the tibia the ransal sir ransal menor i don't have a video just i have a pictures showing that okay so uh, very important is uh, sustained uh, dislocation okay uh maybe we'll take a video uh, and then show you next time um it's hard to explain how to do it but uh, the best way to do it is as you're flexing and if you so the whole problem comes if you don't do enough release on the medial side and you try to dislocate the tibia it never comes out so externally rotating the tibia flexing the flexing the uh, the the knee yeah. properly doing a medial release and and dislocating it is the best way and the least traumatic way of doing it i'll take a video and then show it probably in one of my talks so in one of the uh, one of the slides it was mentioned that this lateral meniscus has not uh, not to be fully dissected to uh, it would compromise the uh, vascular supply huh. so uh, so so kindly explain how much to uh, dissect the lateral so meniscus if, if like if this is your meniscus normally what we do is we start deep like try to excise the whole meniscus out but as you come to the center part Partner. that is where you have the feeder vessel or the blood supply so you leave a cuff of meniscus and then as you go posterior you go deep and remove the whole thing so both on both on the medial lateral side the blood supply comes in that middle part that is where we usually leave a cuff so that you don't have that issue with bleeding later which tends to happen how much uh, should be the cuff sir very minimal Nick, just so uh, if, you're, if you're going beyond then you would have nicked the vessel um, i learned it the hard way because in my fellowship i used to do tunique without tunique so as i removed the meniscus i could actually see that spurt of blood so then i learned how to make sure that i protect that area so if if time permits and if you have enough cases just do one or two cases without tunique you will exactly know which parts of the knee actually bleed more and then you get a good sense and then you can go back to using the tunic and so uh, uh kindly sir explain something about this uh, how much should be the medial release and the lateral release should be and its relation with the varus and valgus deformities yeah, in the subsequent classes we will deal with in it because we have a class on varus and we have a class on valgus also uh, so we can um, show you because instead of just describing it Uh, the whole purpose of this uh, fellowship is to give you uh, video demonstration also so we'll probably do a better job in trying to explain it with pictures and uh, videos in the subsequent classes we'll move on to the next session sir yeah you can see me you can see my slides sir yes we can see yes sir yes yes so i am dr kishore karmuri i am going to tell about surgical technique in tk this is a very basic uh, way i have uh, prepared the slides and uh, there are different ways of doing the surgery so today i'll be telling one of the many ways and resno mrenal has completed uh, the parapetalar approach so here the medial parapetalar approach i'm showing just one of the systems how we do the surgery 
gap balancing into mega balance will be dealt later so first coming to the position of the patient so before going even commencing the surgery this is how we have to keep a boulder or a sandbag under the maximum girth of the calf any patient unless it's a stiff knee or we don't have a range of motion more than 70 or 90 in almost all the cases the sandbag has to be placed at the maximum girth of the calf that will give you a nice flexion and stability while doing the surgery and this is our uh, Mayo trolley instruments. These are the basic instruments that is needed for uh, the surgery. Two Langenbachs, one small uh, nibbler and big nibbler, one curved osteotome and one straight osteotome, one hammer or mallet, two narrow osteotomes, one broad osteotome, one curved and straight poker, two arteries, 22 number blade, and 11 number only in, maybe we use it in only in robotics, and a two forceps. So these are the basic instruments for any surgery. So next coming to the way how we uh, scrub the patient, a small video. So one of our technician with the sterile gloves, he scrubs with Torexin scrub, even scrubs the foot and there's one more assistant waiting with a sterile glove to hold the foot. So once uh, the scrubbing is finished, uh, as a sterile mop and a uh, sterile glove and now that he takes off the soap or foam with the help of a mop, sterile mop. Yeah, so a chlorhexidine based scrub and an alcohol based skin prep is the best. Yeah. So there's evidence to that. So you guys should follow that. So there's a side post also, thigh post and a sandbag. So that's how we have to scrub the patient. And uh, next, we're coming to a draping video. So there are many ways to drape, uh, but the basic uh, principle is there should be two layers below and above and all work, 360 degrees, like in any orthopedic surgery. There should be two layers in uh, 360 degrees. Uh, this is a disposable drape, but uh, if you have a line in uh, drapes also, you can do that. And you have to cover all both arms, which are extended. And still our assistant is holding the mop, the sterile mop. Uh, we make sure that we don't touch him. So we are uh, now closing the both uh, hands of the patient now. And after that, we use a uh, screen towel. Always remember the when you people keep our instruments on the tummy or the abdomen of the patient, which should be avoided because that is uh, that is relatively unsterile area, even in spite of all these drapes. So all the instruments should should go back to Mayo trolley once their work is done. This is a screen, just completely the proximal part is completely cordoned, it's completely separated now. So now without touching your assistant, just hold the calf away from the mop he takes, yes. And then uh, again, because the assistant has moved from the part, we have to complete this called uh, long drape. Definitely that area should be covered immediately when the assistant moves. The foot part. Now the foot with the cover and the stock in it. Then the cling roll. <clears throat> the important uh, part here uh, while uh, draping with the cling roll is don't invert or uh, don't internal rotate your foot. This is very important in a conventional scenario because if the ankle is uh, out and the foot is internally rotated, that might give you a false impression of alignment. So make sure that uh, the foot is not uh, inverted. See, if you see he's accelerating the foot, means the foot and ankle should be in the same line. This will create a lot of confusion and most people spend their time here. Because one in one direction, it shows a different alignment and the other different. So applying the cling roller Whatever should be 
done properly. The foot is completely closed now. Then this is a U drape. There are different types of this O drape where it goes through the foot after this step and the big screen comes. Yeah, even if you're using Lenin, yeah, just use a U drape in the yeah, end. Uh, that's a good, uh, uh, I would say, thing to do. At least you have one more impervious layer on top. Now here we use that uh, sterilium. Yeah. So uh, after applying the sterilium, um, let it air dry. Then only apply the ioba and then inflate. So as Minal explained, this is the skin incision medial to the articular tuberosity, medial uh, third of patella and in the center of the thigh. So in the initial part, if you are a beginner. Always keep your uh, one index finger on the supramedial border while you are curving to make adequate cuff and inframedial border while curving the inferior part of the incision so that adequate cuff will be there. So once you uh, immediately open, you should go either an anti-clockwise or a clockwise. Start from patella, inferior patella, retinaculum, inferior intrapatella pad of fat, then go superior to the um, synovial and then uh, medial collateral ligament or start the other way. But make sure you do it in orderly so that you won't forget any step. Here is the uh, medial uh, plique, which is tight. Generally, if there'll be more than two, more than one plique, when you just subluxate the patella to one side, just inferior plique should be removed, not the superior part uh, plique, because that might uh, hamper the blood supply. And then coming to the intrapatella part of it, in uh, the different ways of doing it as, uh, just if you just uh, avoid the patella, you'll be able to see the fat pad. This is one of the ways of doing it. Just find a gap between the patella tendon and fat pad and just insert an artery. Open the artery to see whether it's in the tendon or not. If the, if the artery opens freely, it's not in the tendon. If the artery is having difficulty opening, then it must be in tendon, so you have to readjust the artery. Then use a pottery to make a longitudinal dissection. And these are the two parts of the dissection. Then you can see the patella tendon and then remove the intrapatella fat as much as needed. You can always remove less. You can always remove later. So after coming and get to the superior part, this is called the suprapatella pouch. Uh, as Dr. Swas was saying, you can remove as much as needed. In a conventional scenario or especially if you are using depu, we need more exposure than, uh, than other systems because it has a big stylus. So, and uh, we'll have to exactly put the stylus on the lateral, lateral most prominent part of the cortex. And when you are taking the suprapatellar uh, uh, synovium, don't go beyond the ridge on the medial and lateral, because if you go inferior, medial and lateral beyond the ridge, there will be genicular plexus, which will bleed, and uh, they might cause more soakage after the surgery, once the tonic is off. And now, uh, as they have shown, this is a very favorite part of Dr. Uh, Guru Reddy. So here, this the, the mouse is showing the isosceles triangle of exposure. This is a standard exposure of uh, deep MCL, irrespective of varus valgus or anini. We haven't gone through the mid-coronal plane. We just have opened this one. So this is a part of exposure. It's not a part of release. And the other, I'm talking about this triangle. Yeah, even in valgus, you can do this much. Yes, this is not a part of release. And the other one triangle, which uh, Dr. Gurwaradi says this, is to re relax the patella tendon. So here it's sublex. So even if abnormal pressure is applied to the patella tendon, it won't uh, it won't avulse. So here also, we ex uh, just periosteally, we just release the tissue here. Uh, we just lift it. So our patella tendon will be safe. Yeah, this is the area I was talking about. If you if you are unable to sublux, to release this part. Next, coming to the osteophytes, medial osteophytes on the medial border. The importance of removing medial osteophytes it dents the medial collateral ligament, so it's important to remove. But don't try to remove all the osteophytes, especially in the inferior part. Um, here we are removing the just from the anterior part of the osteophyte, or which is visible. The postermost part will be removed only through cut. You'll not be able to remove the osteophyte. It, be, it might so happen we might damage the 
um, epicondyle here. So we just remove the anterior part of the osteophyte. And if at all, if there are notch osteophytes, we remove the notch osteophytes called notch plasty. At the same time, we can deroof here the PCL along the bony border of uh, the notch and ACL will be removed from here. So yes, we have removed, the uh, is ready for uh, preparation and everything. So here, we are talking about mechanical element, other elements won't be possible in a conventional method. We have to use the robot for that. And we are talking about measure resection, gap balance will be dealt later. Part of exposure is lateral meniscus also has to be released. Sir? Lateral meniscus lateral also. Meniscus that, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. actually, yes, sir. I, yeah. I missed that. that video is not playing. So here, the lateral meniscus, uh, that uh, once the, should it, after the Ransal, we are talking, sir, now? Right away. Is it necessary? Is it yeah, Dr. Kulkarni. Not at all, not at all. Because sometimes when the notch is completely obliterated, <clears throat> that is when you have to uh, open it up. Because any amount of uh, manipulation on the tibia, you cannot do without putting a spike. Yes. So in cases where the notch is obliterated, you try to take it out. And if you are a CR surgeon, again, you want to see the PCL pretty the well. PCL. So you'll have to open up this area. So first of all, we have to understand the basic cuts in uh, TKR, the distal femur cut, anterior and posterior cuts and chamfers for the implant, uh, for the plant implantation, proximal tibial cut. If we are planning for PSN, it's a box cut. So what are the significance of these cuts? Uh, as we know, tibia affects both flexion extension and uh, distal femur cut ex uh, affects only extension. Posterior femoral cut ex uh, affects only flexion. Entry point, Kishore. Sir, madam. Entry point, entry point. Tell something about entry point. Next time coming, madam. Next time coming to that. Yeah. So coming to the digital femoral cut. So there are two methods of it, intramedular element or extramedular element guide. But we are using intramedular element rod in all the systems. This is regularly used. There's something extramedullary uh, femoral guide is there. Just this is after the intramedullary entry to see uh, since some surgeons place a knob here or the femoral head, this is there in depth view to see if our alignment and our uh, valgus valgus is proper or not. This is not to be this need not be done in all cases or need not be done at all. Usually, if you have an extra medullary deformity, yeah. So instead of using that particular device, you can use an ECG lead on the center of the head of femur. You do a DS, do a CM shot, put the ECG lead on top. And then you'll have some reference as to whether you are in mechanical access or not. So the silk cut, we know we cut it in six, uh, five to six degrees of valgus, even a varus knee. So we know that because we are putting an intramedullary rod in accordance to the anatomical axis. So the difference between the anatomical and mechanical axis is uh, uh, six degrees. So we are cutting the digital cut in uh, mm -hmm. six degree valgus. So that is the concept behind taking the valgus cut in five to six degrees of cut. Yeah, so if you're very, for... very nitpicking on what should be the angle, you can do a scanogram, do yeah. both measurements, calculate the difference between them, which is the valgus correction angle. So some That's the ideal way to do. do. That's the ideal way to do. If you're learning in early, that's the ideal way to do, as I was saying, scanogram. So coming to the uh, starting of uh, this uh, distal femoral cut, this is a white side line drawn along the PCL insertion uh, toward the proximal leg. Um, and the entry point is 5 to 6 mm um, anteriorly and uh, 2 to 3 mm medially. So I personally extend this line along the shaft anteriorly to see if I'm center. So that gives me an idea where my alignment rod is, uh, uh, where my intramedullary guide is going. And uh, this one is a pin just to make a roughening of the surface of this point for the drill not to slip. 
so while drilling i i kept my finger on the anterior cortex and this is the drill just this gives me an idea that i am parallel to the anterior cortex so i won't pierce any cortex so this gives me an idea whether i am not be piercing any cortex and this is after drilling you see so this is exactly the point which we need and i always say to my fellows there should be light in our life but not light in this canal if there so we can see some light in this canal means you have breached the cortex the best way to avoid that is after you enter you just let the drill take its own course exactly so you have to you, and then you should be in some amount of valgus so if if this is the femur this is this is valgus so as you are entering if you are if you are entering more valgus or neutral then there is something wrong and then there is there is absolutely no hesitation in actually doing a c arm shot to make sure you haven't done anything wrong so just enter and let the drill take its own course yes. if you have resistance then either move up and down medial lateral but don't force it in that yes. is very important yes so what i said to the fellows is just enter the cortex once you enter the cortex there will be the resistance will be gone then after that press intermittently so it will take its own course you need not in initial days at least don't press don't the it. trigger continuously So again, this is about uh, PFC. How it will be there? The right and left will be there. There will be valgus marking on this. And once you kept it, how uh, we should make the jig seal? Don't make uh, any system. Not only the PFC. Any system. Don't try. Don't try to make both surfaces on. Sorry. Don't make both surfaces to sit on both condyles. If it sits on one condyle, that's enough. Don't yeah, it's not need, mandatory that it not has to touch on both sides. It won't go also. Suppose if it it's touching one condyle. The other tip is this is why you have to remove the osteophyte. Sometimes it sits on the osteophyte. Yes, at least and especially the less amount of bone. Yes. So if you clear on both edges and if you're touching even one condyle, because you have to reference from at least one. Yes. So here we have in a, in any system there will be marking like zero plus two minus two. In uh, except in Smith and if you this is a universal in Smith and if you you have it it is a two plus two and a plus four um, zero plus two and plus four there is no minus in Smith and if you uh, so this based on this you just pin in the boxes they have given and then you can go for the cut before going for cut after the fixation with the uh, pins and everything and while doing this step in the center while you insert the jig. You make sure the distal part and the anterior part. The distal jig is sitting on the distal cortex, and this cutting jig is sitting on the anterior cortex. The surgeon should stabilize it, and the assistant should put the pins. A lot of uh, surgeons have misconception that you are also deciding rotation of the femur. You are not deciding that rotation. So if your cutting block is slightly off, it is not it is doing nothing to the rotation of the femur. You are only taking the distal femur cut. So don't be too fixated on how it has to sit on the anterior cord. If it touches, that's more than enough. If it's slightly off, that's not a big deal. So once you keep that, always sit with the angel wing or a blade. So the angel wing just it has to skim, just touch the apex of the notch. If it is touching the apex of the notch, means you cut is good. If it's in the air, means you are cutting less. If it's going deep, means you are cutting more. So this is how you feel it from the side. we can feel that and once you start cutting always at least in the beginning stage always start in the center mark both condyles at a single shot and then go to one condyle and always saw it in a um, horizontal direction don't go just one like this horizontal direction and don't make sure that the blade doesn't cross the medial border more than 1/3 so once once you finish the cut you can take the jig and see whether it is exactly sitting on the both this for the beginners i'm saying again whether your the jig is sitting exactly smooth without any seesawing movement so then your cut is good cut then your cut is good no irregularity is there if the if there is a play in the jig then it might so happen that you might cut the posterior part more 
then the cut would go in flexion or the anterior part less than the cut would go in extension. You should make sure that should not happen. In the initial days, once you finish with the cut, you are happy with the cut, always mark your pin entry points so that you can revisit the cut uh, once you, uh, again if you want it. If you want to take a plus two cut, if you mark these entry uh, points with a quarter, you can revisit the cut always. So here, uh, today I'm explaining the surgical technique uh, in the uh, first distal cut, next tibial cut, then we'll address the femur again. So after... Uh, this is uh, I show as zero, this zero plus two minus two. Um, here, distal femoral condyle, regardless of implant, or oh, the cut is always nine mm. Except in striker. Yeah, except size, implant size. For example, if it is in uh, PFC, it is 1.5 to 2.5, uh, any size, this distal cut uh, doesn't change. It's always nine mm. Striker is eight mm. Uh, striker is eight mm. Means it's constant it's for a particular implant. It's married to the instrumentation, is married to the implants. So yeah. You should, should know what is the minimal you have to cut. Yes. Sir. Yeah. You have to, that sometimes you'll have to go more based on what surgery uh, requirement is. Something. And the deformity. Yes, sir. So, uh, distal femoral cut uh, can affect the joint line. If you cut more, obviously, your joint line will be increased because. How much you are cutting, we are replacing with the metal with the 9 mm. So you should keep in mind that if you cut more than 9, your joint line will, will be elevated. That should be kept in the mind. So using a thicker poly doesn't do anything to your joint line. Please understand that. Especially uh, as you cut more femur, you are definitely elevating the joint line. Joint line. For the tibia, it is different. But as you, so what is the tolerance? Around 4 millimeters. Yes. Beyond which enough. it's yeah, beyond which it starts having effect on the patellofemoral kinematics. Yes. And even as you go beyond 13 mm, you'll be reaching the medial epicondyle level and it will be a problem. So distance from the lateral epicondyle or the medial epicondyle to the distant joint line is around 25 millimeters to 30 millimeters. So now, as I said, I'll be going through first uh, distal femoral cut and next proximal tibial cut. So uh, we are do planning a mechanical alignment. So it has to be perfectly mechanical. Here also we have intramedullary and extramedullary. Intramedullary generally we use it in revisions. Most of the cases it's extramedullary. So as uh, Sir was saying about Ransal, I ha just have a picture here. A video would be a better understanding. So Ranavat and Insal has proposed this uh, uh, way of for delivering the tibia into the wound. So <coughs> this is a superior yeah. elevation of deep MCL. As uh, we have given that first isosceles triangle of MCL release, then if you go to mid coronal plane along this one, there will be some release uh, just uh, underneath the border. Then hyperflexion of the knee and external rotation of leg and foot. This will generally deliver the tibia into the wound. This is called Ransal maneuver. Don't if it is a tight knee or a stiff knee, don't keep all the pressure and your energy into uh, doing uh, doing this maneuver. If it is tight, there might be a mechanical block or a soft tissue block. So first we have to release the PA. If if you are not if it's not happening, even after the uh, under the rim, if you release and if it's not happening, then try see whether you have released the PCL uh, insertion of the tibia. In spite of release and PCL insertion, if it is not happening, probably there is a posterior tibial osteophyte that is blocking uh, this Ransal maneuver. So that can be seen in the lateral X-ray. So all, always don't uh, try and do it forcefully. Understand what is blocking and do it. If it is not happening completely, you need not. Uh, in all cases, if you see the posterior border, it's it's good. But in a tightness and the stiffness, if you are unable to see the post board of tibia also, we can go ahead with the tibial cut. Once the cut is done, probably you'll be able to see the whole tibia. But that has to be done a little conservatively. So cutting the distal femur first does not give you any added advantage of no. dislocating the tibia. Okay? Yes. So those two steps are independent, number one. Independent. Nine out of ten times, you should be able to dislocate your tibia anteriorly if you are a tibia first surgeon. But if you feel 
it's easy to do the whole femur first and then go on to the tibia it is perfectly fine but the big difference between both is if you do tibia first you are simultaneously controlling your flexion and extension gap at the same time but if you're doing the femur first you would have cut the distal femur and posterior femur you might end up with some discrepancy in between your flexion and extension gap so wherever possible i would say if you're starting off even though it is slightly more challenging try to dislocate your tibia do your tibial cut first extend the femur see how your extension gap is flex and then decide on what to do with your femur but for the ease of surgery doing the femur first is definitely easy but you might have trouble at the end uh, trying to control your flexion and extension so that's the big difference a lot of uh, uh, people ask me should you do femur first or tibia first so i would recommend tibia first so that you can equally control your flexion extension gap and keeping sizer will be easier if you do tibia so after the, after the delivering the tibia into the wound the next is to to cut the tibia so here for any jig three things has to be seen one is slope one is alignment and level of cut these three things uh, should be seen while you are keeping a tibial jig so when tibial jig jig so in the pfc we have at least 3 degrees slope in the cutting jig and 2 degrees in the infer inferior part so it depends on system to system so if uh, the markings are not th not there then at least you have to see with your fingers for me it is three fingers uh, so you should be able to understand the, how much it is when as you go you will be understanding it is very arbitrary method so there's the slope which i'll fix and the second thing is i'll fix uh, the jig is at the center of the ankle this is the second thing alignment i'm talking about and if you come to the superior part the proximal part this line should be exactly interspinous line along and towards the pcl insertion so this will give you a proper cut if the jig is more internally rotated or towards more medial this line is more medial then there's a chance that the cut might be varus or if it is more lateral or external rotated there's a chance that <coughs> the cut is valgus so always try to keep the center of the jig or if the line is present on the jig to the interspinous and pcl insertion so there's a domino effect here this is where most surgeons go wrong if your lateral is not exposed properly you won't be able to move your jig right in the center and then you ending up you end up giving a, a, a non mechanical cut and then you will be chasing your tail so exposure expose your lateral side well put your jig right in the center which is usually in line with the medial aspect of the tuberosity and then the 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 extra medullary guide and the leg if they are parallel to each other then there is no slope being added only the slope that is there in your uh, cutting jig is there as you add more uh, if if you move the extra medullary guide away from the leg you are giving more slope okay it depends on whether doing cr or a ps on an average 5 degrees of slope is good for a cr up to 7 degrees we are going up to 7 now but if you are doing a ps 0 to 3 so lateralizing your jig and trying to be as center as possible is probably the most important step in your tkr because if you get your tibial cut right then that will guide you further and you'll have less issues to try to get your tibial cut uh, right in the first instance or spend little more time on getting your tibial cut right especially if you are doing a gap balancing tibial cut is everything so as i said the landmarks the proximal landmarks are anterior version of uh, pcl and uh, medial third of tibial tuberosity the distal landmarks are center of ankle second metatarsal or ehs you know these people probably the eh uh, ehl is little difficult to find so some people some uh, surgeons keep a ecg lead in the center of the ankle by seeing in the uh, cm or something there are different ways of uh, finding the center of ankle but that is the distal landmarks yeah even if you have tibia vara extra articular deformity just don't worry about anything medial third of tuberosity center of the ankle that's those yes. are the two at least uh, the basic landmarks that you need to follow so as i said alignment and slope is done then the level of cut um, so this is different uh, implants have different stylus 
So this is one of the stylus. This is probably Smitan nephew. And here there is my uh, this is a different thing which I do in my all my cases. Maybe Swasta should uh, give his opinion. So this is a tibial tuberosity, and uh, from the superior part of tibial tuberosity, I keep a thumb, and I draw a line a just on the superior border of my thumb. Actually, it uh, never went wrong with this technique. So this is the maximum that? cut I can take. Uh, uh, this is the maximum cut I can take. This line limits me from cutting below this. If I go below this line, probably I'll be reaching the fibular head level. So this is experience speaking and nothing else. But it, but this will give you an extra confidence that you are not cutting more. Uh, so, but uh, ideally, if you are using jigs and everything, the more scientific way. So uh, once you uh, the level when you when you keep the alignment right, use a stylus, and uh, the stylus should be touching. If you see in the center picture, it just should touch the um, cartilage on the lateral uh, tibial condyle and uh, generally it would be 8 or 9 mm on the lateral side and uh, 0 or 2 mm on the medial side if you use the stylus so once you fix that then you fix uh, the cutting jig with the pins here also we have a uh, 2 plus 2 and minus 2 and once you fix the pins you can check the cut with the help of a uh, angel wing or a, a saw blade whether our cut is going through and through to the posterior cortex or not or how much defect are we expecting on the medial uh, tibial condyle is what we see all this in all these things. So, yeah, measuring from the lateral is more reliable because more reliable. Yes. you don't have any cartilage wear or uh, defect. On the medial side, you can have a lot of scalloping, bone loss. So try to measure from the lateral side, which is a little more reliable. And best way to know whether you've cut enough or not is use a caliper and just measure. So if you're, if you're using, if you're cutting 9 mm, and curve of the blade is say one millimeter. So you should have at least eight millimeters of uh, cut thickness in the center part from where you measured. So as you are operating in your initial cases, it's always good to most uh, instrumentations have a caliper. So you just measure and see what your cutting is right or not. So once you know you're consistently doing well, you could stop doing it. But usually measuring from the lateral side is more reliable. As yes. compared to the medial side. Yeah, if it's in a valgus, probably we should measure from the medial side. Yeah. So again, which side is worn out is the key. Yeah. So yes. measure from the side which is not <laughs> worn out. And if you are not using a proper jig and if you haven't stabilized your jig while measuring this, and after taking the stylus and if you're putting pins, make sure you lock the level of the cut and then put the pins. Otherwise, once you put the put the pins again, the cut will vary. So that's why. Always, once you fix uh, the pins, always measure with the angel wing or uh, tibial blade so that you will have an idea about the cut in your initial days. Yeah, meaning some instrumentations, you can move the level of the cut after you fix it. Yeah. Some instrumentations, you have to decide the level of the cut and pin. So, uh, you dis know which instrumentation you're using. So I have somebody's, uh, I think, yeah, sir, go ahead, sir. Uh, what point, exact point should be taken uh, on the stylus? So, because anterior, posterior, medial, lateral. So, what should be the point? Uh, so, usually take? lateral side is uh, convex, right? The tibia. So, take the, the highest point. So, you want to measure and cut from the most prominent point of the bone. Medially, because of the defect, you won't be exactly knowing where to take it from. So on the lateral side, the highest point, which is usually in the midpoint. Sometimes if you want to reference from the medial side, well and good, but you have to make a mental uh, picture in your mind and decide where you want the cut to exit and measure it there and then take the cut. So lateral side, highest point, the answer to your question. So once you cut uh, the tibial cut uh, here again while using the blade, uh, the video would have, the video would have been better. While using the blade, always start in the properly from the anterior cortex. Then what whatever the way, finish out the medial first and go lateral first. But make sure it comes in a single biscuit. That would be better. And maintain the level of cut. Don't change your uh, angle of the saw. Sometimes uh, if it's a too much play in the jig, then you might cut more posterior than anterior. Uh, generally, I think that these days, except uh, very much used jigs, uh, the, the jig is not that, it doesn't have that much play. But maintain the angle of the blade while you're cutting, while you're finishing the whole cut. 
So here in the center picture, you can see this is a PFC jig. Yeah. And on the medial side, this is a minimally invasive jig. So the yeah, big difference between there. both yeah. is uh, the chances of injuring the patella tendon are more in the center one, right? Because your saw can go through and through. So important is to have a spike on the lateral side and be conscious of the fact that you're very close to your patella tendon as you're cutting on the lateral side. So you don't have to see how well you're cutting. You have to make sure that you're protecting your soft tissue well, especially when using a wider jig. Like this. When you're using smaller jigs, the chances of cutting the patella tendon are less. So once you've mounted the jig, you make sure that whether the patella tendon is within the purview of the jig or not. If it is, which is most often the case, make sure you should be very careful as uh, as how you're cutting and you're not injuring. Otherwise, you take the tibial cut and then you realize that you've already nicked the patella tendon. So once your cut is done, now we should uh, verify whether your cut is in whether virus or valgus. I particularly feel for a beginner, you have to, for every step, there are three ways or two ways of checking whether you are done right or not. Whether it's a distal femur cut, proximal tibia, post anterior, whatever cut it is. So here, uh, if you first check, always try to see hyperflex the knee and try to go to the bend to your cut level and see whether it's varus varus. There's a lot of uh, intra-observer variability among this, this cut. But practice this. This cut should be parallel to the roof or flow. Hyperflex it and just see. And the second way is just keep a spacer and uh, drop the alignment rod. And uh, somehow uh, uh, there's a uh, typical preparation jig, keep that and see whether the element is right or not. This alignment rod, before may, before leaving the alignment rod, uh, make sure that your uh, foot and ankle are in the same plane and your uh, hyperflexion knee and the leg also should be straight. Sometimes the leg will be leaning to one side and your uh, foot and ankle are not in the same plane. That will give a biased opinion about your alignment. So always adjust the position of the limb first and then keep the spacer or jig and then drop the rod. Not before that. Second thing important is, again, uh, there are two choices here, right? This is the spacer block, the middle one. And the right one is actually the tibial base plate. So this is PFC instrument. Any instrumentation, because it has modularity, once you put the drop rod, you toggle and see even before you put in. If there is a lot of toggle, between the base plate and the rod, meaning either the rod is too small or he hasn't given you the right rod or the attachment is loose. That itself can give you 10 degrees of error. So it is better to use a spacer block where the hole really matches uh, the drop rod pretty well as compared to the base plate because the way PFC thing goes and sits, uh, they, the, the toggle itself can give you 10 degrees of error. So try to measure and confirm your cut using both the spacer block as well as the TVL base plate. And then even before putting, especially in PFC and Smith & Nephew, there's so much of play because of how the instrumentations have been designed. The base plate and the, the rod or whatever is attachment, attached. the handle. Yeah, to the handle. And here also, if you see if um, someone is pressing the medial uh, 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 malleolus inside, so the ankle should be out and the foot should be in. That's why I was saying while well, draping also, this is this is important because if you don't drape properly, this will use a lot of bias and uh, the first impression is always, uh, it will it will not leave your mind. You will be always in doubt until you finish, until you see the x-ray next day or something. So for every step, there are two, three ways and these are three ways you have to see whether alignment is proper or not. And if you find out whether it's varus or valgus in your initial days, always reapply the jig and cut. Don't go with the um, naked eye or with the free hand, always reapply the jig and do it in initial days. That would be easier for you. So uh, tell them about the drop rod. How, how yeah. do you know it is a varus cut or a varus cut? Uh, so as what if 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 the drop rod is a simple thing, wherever wherever the drop rod goes, if it's not in the center, that side bone is more. You have to cut that side. A simple thing. Yeah. So if the drop rod is going rose medial, it's a valgus cut. If it's lateral, it's a varus cut. Simple thing. So instead of confusing yourself whether this is varus or valgus, if you are not 90 and if you're not on top of your ankle, whichever side the drop rod is moving, you, you have to cut be. more on that, that side. Yeah. You should cut that side to correct the, correct. Uh, the aberration that you have. 
and it is always better to put the jig back on and cut. That's what he said. So uh, here again, after cutting the digital femur and tibia, I was measuring my extension gap. Mm, so it's almost right. But here, if you feel there's an FFD here, you can go back to digital femur. That's why I kept my pins intact. If I don't have my extension gap properly, I can cut some more. So that's what I was saying. After, removing the, pins, after removing the pins, mark the pin entry because if you have to revise it, uh, that would be helpful. If you have some FFD and you know that there are a lot of posterior osteophytes, yeah. you can stay uh, with the cut. You don't have to increase the cut. Yeah, Dr. Gopal. Yes, sir. I, I wanted to ask about that alignment rod. Does the medial uh, release also have any effect on this rod? Suppose we have uh, we have not released adequately on the medial aspect. As it, as it is, there is going to be some virus in the knee. No, the release has nothing to do with the level of uh, the cut. Uh, because uh, what all that you're testing is you're placing something flat on your tibial cut and you're seeing whether you're uh, at perpendicular to the ankle or not. So the amount of release has no bearing on the validity of your cut. So the, the 90 degrees that you have to do, entirely it's coming from the bone, nothing from the soft tissue. So now I'm checking my extension gap. Extension gap looks okay. So I'll remove my pins and then I'll uh, start addressing the femur, fin finish the remaining uh, femoral cuts. So there was a lot of uh, discussion um, last time on uh, referencing systems and referencing posterior referencing. So I was telling that referencing system comes into play only when there's uh, in-between sizes. It just should not matter until there's a very gross deformity or a severe deformities. So here, let us just have a small glimpse. Uh, this is a um, posterior referencing. So as the size increases or decreases, the, the anterior cut is one which changes. The posterior cut doesn't change. It stays constant. So the name goes with the design, the philosophy, right? In yeah. posterior referencing, posterior cut doesn't change. It's constant. Yeah. In anterior referencing, anterior cut remains constant. So that's the first thing that you need to understand. <coughs> Got the point? So all posterior referencing systems, the amount of posterior cut is always same. As you change the size, the amount of anterior cut changes. In anterior referencing, anterior is constant, posterior changes. There was a lot of discussion last class, uh, sir, on uh, what referencing system should we use? Okay. Uh, so uh, it's explained. Uh, so uh, I feel that there's no, unless it is very severe FFDs or severe deformities, uh, references doesn't matter. No, it, it all depends on your flexion and extension gap. Yes, right? that's what I'm saying. Yeah. So, say, yeah, sorry, sir, continue. Yeah, so in, in your, see the, the advantage and disadvantage of a posterior referencing system. In posterior referencing system, the posterior cut is constant, right? So if you're measuring and you don't size your femur well, the chances of notching anteriorly are higher. Okay. Now, if you want to increase your gap in a posterior referencing system, you will be able to do that based on the ability to move the jig anterior, right? So that can be done because of uh, the modularity you have in the hole. So you measure you see if your flexion gap is too tight and you want little more cut, then you can move the jig. The way the jig, the cutting block can be moved is different in different systems. Smith and Nevy does it differently. Uh, and the Depew does it that. differently. So the decision of sizing is, is always the interplay between what your flexion gap is and what your extension gap is. If you're tighter on both sides, you don't worry because you can take the TBR off. And you'll be back to normal. But if you have discrepancy in your in your flexion and extension gap, and you want to preferentially open one gap over the other, then the referencing system and how to change the gap come into play. So in a posterior referencing system, if you increase the size of the femur, it doesn't do anything to your posterior cut. 
the only way you can open your posterior gap is by moving the axial jig physically up. Okay. Again, it is very different for an anterior referencing system. In anterior referencing system, the anterior cut is constant. So there is no way you can notch. You're measuring from the anterior side. Now, if you want to increase the gap in an anterior referencing system, you can downsize the femur. Use a smaller femur so that you can cut more bone. So how you open your flexion gap is based on what system you use. So in posterior referencing, you have to move the jig. In an anterior referencing system, you can downsize or upsize to either close or open the gap. Is that clear? Uh, how to uh, referencing system tells you with which gap we can we, we are constant and which gap we can play around. Yeah. Something about uh, dialing was also mentioned by ma'am last time. In ah, yes, in all posterior referencing systems, there is a dialing system in the jig so that there will not be any confusion. If you want to downsize the component, you can dial it. That means the block will move up. The block will move up so that you can cut posteriorly and you can downsize the component to avoid notching. To avoid notching. In anterior referencing system, there is no problem. Directly, you can put a C block over the D block and you can cut posteriorly and you can downsize the component. Whereas in posterior referencing system, all companies, they have dialing. Yes, ma'am. So next comes the femoral sizing. So a lot of people are asking, what is stylus? So this is stylus. It, the, the shape and thing changes from company to company. This is Smith & Nephew company. This is Smith & Nephew. Yeah. So once you fix the sizing again, then you keep a stylus on the most prominent part on the lateral cortex. Um, and for example, this is PFC. Go go back on that picture, uh, Kishore. I will show them what man is saying. Yeah, dialing. Here. So move, move, the, move your cursor on this, the center part here. <clears throat> yeah, so that you can open up with a screwdriver, right? Screwdriver. Now you measured mm -hmm. your now you measured your size as, for example, four. This is a posterior referencing system, but you want more opening in your flexion gap. The way you can do it is see these uh, the other two holes. Kishore, show the other two holes. The yeah. So this is where you actually pin, right? So now in in Smith and Nephew, what you can do is you can use a screw, use a screwdriver. As you open this, these two holes move actually up. move up. And then you create more flexion gap. So that is what Madam is trying to say. So every system does it differently. So what Madam is saying is very specific to Smith & Nephew, where you can use a screwdriver and open this screw. As you open up the screw, the two holes actually move up and create more flexion space. So that's what it means by dialing. So you can still retain a four size yeah. uh, femur open up your flexion and uh, this is a deputy thing this is a stylus here so here once you cut and you always measure from the lateral side lateral side see here it's touching on the topmost part so but the very uh, important point is when you are uh, keeping this jig make sure that it is uh, completely sh um, flush with the distal cut Except in Smith and Nephew, in all other cases, that will determine the rotation. If it's not flush, uh, then if it's off, then the rotations might change. So make sure that it's flush, and may and uh, so the surgeon should be pressing it towards the distal femur surface, and the assistant should be pinning wherever the surgeon asks for. That is why tibial cut will help in keeping sizer. If you cut tibia, it is easy to keep the sizer. Flush it to the distal cut and uh, move the stylus. Make sure of the size and put the pins. So once sir, you is it mandatory, uh, sorry, is it mandatory to touch the posterior condyle? Both condyles should be touched to that part. Uh, so the, the ways the sizes are developed is it has to hitch onto the posterior aspect of the condyle. So, this... so in a way, yes. Here, Suppose, a when you are dealing with valgus thing, the surface, except in 
very rare hypochondroplasia uh, lateral condylar hypoplastic condyle that except in that scenario most yeah. all cases uh, the jigs will be sitting on the postcondylar surface yeah so it is independent of your tibial cart yeah and that is the reason you have to use one or more than one ways of actually deciding your rotation once yes. you put your pins in before you take your cut you draw your white sides line you draw your transept condylar axis pca is are anyway in, in in view based on these three lines and the position of your pins decide whether your rotation is right or wrong okay any variation in the hypoplasia of the posterior condyle sir any yeah, so out of the three three lines the most uh, unreliable is the posterior condylar axis the the second more the actually the most reliable is the tea because tea doesn't change irrespective yeah, of the uh, amount of deformity that you have problem with white side is our ability to actually draw that line so out of the three if i have to bank on one it is the tea axis so based on the tea axis you have to decide whether you want to extend it more or not again based on whether you have tightness on your flexion medial so based on that you can decide the rotation yeah yeah these are the lines sir am audible sir yeah yes, audible the signal is unstable or i don't madam am audible yeah you are audible very much audible, yeah. Sir. yeah so what so is here, the flexion gap what decides the flexion gap and how to increase or decrease the flexion gap so uh... so we just mentioned the whole thing last 5 10 minutes we were discussing that after you take your distal femur and tibia what you have to do is put your leg at 90 degrees and then stress your ligaments and see how much opening is there okay now if you feel your gap is too tight you are already thinking in your mind that i have to open my flexion gap more based on your referencing system you decide how to open up your gap in a anterior referencing system you downsize in a posterior referencing system you try to move the jig more anterior to create space got the point so based on what system you are using you have to decide that if you have only Postero medial tightness, you can overcome that by giving more external rotation. External rotation. So okay, these so are the two points the that will help you. Yeah. Go ahead. Yes. So anteroposterior sizing here, for example, in this uh, picture, we can see a three is fixed here, and uh, we have fixed the three here. In, this is in depth. um you know uh, so once you fix that three i fix the rotation here with the pins in this this is a world so for example the... here uh, yeah if you yeah. want to open the gap you can just instead of uh, what's the size that three sir three right so yes, you sir. just select 2.5 you would have moved everything anterior and you just cut so you open up your flexion gap like that Yeah, go ahead, Kishore. It's already ten o'clock. So And the instrument uh, we take separate class. They are confusing. No, no. I'm just talking about PFC, madam. Just okay. for uh, okay. one, one more, just for comparison, for remembrance only. So because I just, I just uh, that's why I showed only PFC here. So here three and three is fixed here. See, yeah. Uh, med then medial lateral sizing is important. Is also is also important to know, but anteroposterior is more important than medial lateral. So take opposite side femur and uh, keep on the distal femur cut surface and see how much is overhang and other thing. But finally, anteroposterior fit is more important than medial lateral. Some overhang can be accepted, not underhang. So once the sizing is done, then uh, as uh, Swaha sir and Madam are discussing, the rotation uh, is how these uh, these methods are important to decide the rotation. Uh, clinically, uh, I think white side line and transepic condylar axis. And parallel to proteal cut is what we can do on table. Posterior condylar axis clinically we can't measure it, but these three, last three, is what we can do on table. 
So uh, once the sizing is done, and this is why we have we should have a rectangular gap because um, we have to take parallel to the tibia. So the rotation is uh, then because of that. So here there are uh, as the server saying this is the rotation this is parallel to the tibia. The line drawn on the distal femoral surface is parallel tibia. So I know that my rotation is good. So how do you know your component is in rotation? If you see here after keeping a four in one jig. My medial cut is bigger than the lateral cut, so I know my cut is in rotation. So the other way of drawing this line or determining the rotation is uh, keeping a spacer on the tibial cut and drawing a line on the superior border of this that is parallel to the tibia. So that will uh, determine the rotation. If you have to change the rotation in the implants, there are in different systems, there are three, five, seven and everything. So based on that also you can change, but this is the rotation which is parallel to the tibia and this is correct. So after uh, fixing the four in one jig in all systems, always again take the angel wing to make sure you are not notching. As uh, in anti-referencing system, it doesn't notch, but to make sure it doesn't notch, we just we want to make uh, keep the angel wing and see where you're not uh, notching. And after that, once you cut the anchor cut, you will have uh, the confirmation of axial notation is also this grand piano sign. So this cut, so it's it's definitely we are. Uh, have cut the our, uh, femur in external rotation. So coming to the posterior femoral cut, um, uh, this is uh, while cutting the posterior femoral cut, make sure you keep a homens on the medial side to protect the superficial MCL, and uh, keep a. We can't protect popliteus as such, but make sure you don't go um, just um, with the saw continuously the posterior. You should stop once the resistance is gone. If you go continue to cut, even if the resistance is gone, there's a chance that the popliteus will be injured. And after the foreign and jig only, you will cut the anterior and posterior chamfers. If you are doing a PS system, uh, then uh, there will be a box jig. So there are two ways of uh, uh, determining the center of the box. Once the cuts are done, the chamfers are cuts are done, anterior and posterior cuts are done, take a CR uh, component and uh, just for a trial, keep it on the femur and box the cent and mark the center of it. So based on, and after that, if you keep a box jig and if it's parallel or correlating to this, we are me it means we are in the center of the uh, uh, fem femur. So the box, the condyles will not be uneven. To make sure, uh, to make sure, I'm mean, again repeating this step. Once the anterior chamfer and posterior chamfer and anterior and posterior are done, keep a CR component uh, on the femur and mark the box. This is more of an issue for Smith and Nephew because there's some discrepancy in how the box cut uh, jig is there and actual femur. So this is uh, one way of reconfirming whether your box is centralized or not. The other way to do is start lateral and make sure that you're flush on the lateral side. You can leave a little amount of bore on the middle side, not a big deal. But try to center it because once you decide and cut the box, then the femur goes in that same particular place. You have absolutely no maneuverability after that. Especially so it's if it's important a closed box to... system. If it's a closed box system, it's more problematic. And if it's an osteoporotic bone, if a small medial condyle, a small lateral condyle will probably lead to a fracture. So that's an issue with uh, PFC as well as striker. Uh, Smith & Nephew box is smaller. Uh, BP box is small. Max box is small. So if you if you have a smaller patient with uh, uh, a small femur, uh, try to stay away from PFC. At size 1 and size 2 PFC are very notorious of co for causing a fracture because of the size of the box. So we are done with the cuts, everything, box, everything. Then again, as we have shown in the extensor, in extension, in flexion also, you keep a spacer and see, and you can see how medial is tight, lateral is tight, what's happening. Uh, if it's then equal, then okay, we are done with the cuts. Then we go for uh, typical preparation. I'm not going talking in depth with uh, how much to release, how much osteophytes, whatever, because that will be covered in virus and valgus in depth. This is a basic straightforward knee we are talking about. 
and then coming to the tibial preparation we have finished the cuts now uh, we are coming to tibial preparation in tibial preparation the rotation of the tibial tray is important so these are the um uh, anatomical landmarks the uh, postro uh, anteromedial border of uh, the tibia and uh, the medial third of tibial tubercle and if you keep a tibial tray and alignment it has to uh, go into the first web space and a free flow tick technique where you implant your femur poly and uh, base plate and you flex then the tibial tray will take its own rotation based on the femur so these are the ways to determine the rotation of the tibial tray i think this is a step which uh, very few surgeons do but it is very important uh, how the femur and tibia sit on each other is very crucial for your overall uh, satisfaction of your patients because x ray looks good everything looks good but patient says as i flex my knee my knee feels very tight you can see she is able to bend till 120 130 but they say the knee is very tight because the femur the tibia is not sitting in the right position as compared to your femur so if you want them to be nicely aligning one against the other you have to float your tibia meaning you put your trials in flex and extend your femur three or four times then the tibia decides what is the best rotation for it vis a vis the femur and then you can make a mark and then replicate that while you cement the knee if you don't then what happens is the 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 mcl uh, goes into torsion and then it becomes very tight as the knee flexes and congruency will not be there so the three ways you can do it is uh, one is the 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 rim right. of the tibia which he is showing here use the rim as your reference the second way of doing it is is floating the tibia so you see medial lateral ap rotation then float your femur float your tibia so sizing of femur tibia are always on the based on the lateral condyle here also see i have marked my lateral condyle and there are if um, like if you can see not there are two lines here this the medial uh, this line is on the medial border of the tibial tuberosity and this line is a medial one third of tibial tuberosity just after free floating you can do multiple ways but this is uh, this that's, is a neutral rotation that's an external that's rotation. the akagi line yeah the third way of rotation is akagi line akagi line, yes so uh, come we have finished now and uh, maybe small discussion on this soft tissue balancing um if uh, before going into we have finished cuts and we are uh, doing now now we are about to trial so before going into the permutation combinations what is tight and what is loose i just want to make you understand if what part if you release the deep mcl what will uh, increase or decrease so this is a tibia i have divided into four quadrants uh, we will be concentrating on the medial thing as you go from anterior to posterior uh, in the first until mid coronal plane the most affected is flexion as you go beyond the mid coronal plane the extension starts into uh, extension starts to get affected so in the anterior one third it will be flexion in here it will be flexion is equal to extension as you go posterior it will be extension so this has to be remembered in the same way uh, this is just taken from internet uh, because i uh, so here if you have a posterior osteophytes tumor the bigger the osteophyte Uh, there will be a stretch on the posterior capsule and uh, you will feel the tightness of uh, extension gap so the posterior osteophyte of the femur will extend will uh, affect the extension gap i just want to make that point so here i said uh, these are different ways of uh, balancing uh, permutation combinations if extension is tight and flexion is tight means both gaps are uh, tight so as i said we have to uh, address both gaps in one thing that is tibia so recut the tibia if extension is loose and uh, flexion is tight so flexion is tight so here uh, there are two things uh, whether there are any um, osteophytes on the medial side that can release the flexion or you can undersize if it is an anti reference system or increase the posterior slope the increasing the posterior slope uh, of the tibia should be the last thing we should be doing and again extension is stable and flexion tight again the flexion is tight the same thing uh, the medial release if something has to be done in anterior one third 
and uh, uh, the slope. Coming to the next combination, extension is tight, flexion is loose. So as I said, we are marking the pins on the uh, anterior part. So maybe we should recut plus two and uh, recut it and make extension equal to flexion, then it will be okay. If extension is loose and flexion is loose, we don't have an option. We have to go for the next poly. We need not cut anything here. We should go to the next poly. If flexion is loose, then uh, probably we have already cut here. Then um, uh, flexion is loose. Uh, this might uh, mean two things. There might be an FFD. Uh, flexion is loose and extension is uh, tight. This is the first thing. Uh, it might be an FFD. Never undersize your femur in FFD. Because already flexion is loose and you should not undersize because the flexion gap will further increase. So here, if you, here upsizing the femur will decrease the flexion gap. And if it's still loose, maybe instead of CS or CR, we should go for PS. Flexion table extension tight. Again, recut the distal femur. Once, if you have recut the distal femur, always you have to address the chamfers again. And then post the chamfers in any system. So extension loose and flexion uh, stable, then you have to decrease the, if he's in hyperextension before pre-surgery, pre make sure you cut less, minus to take, minus to distal femur cut, then everything will be okay. Along with the bone cuts, if still your uh, flexion is tight, I told this picture because for that only, if your flexion is loose, probably we, you will uh, release here. If extension is there, some tibial osteophyte is there. Maybe if it's too tight, probably you have to release a semi T. So the same thing. This is the, as I said, the soft tissue thing. If middle compartment is too tight, super um, deep MCL. Sometimes you have to do the pie crusting of uh, superficial MCL. So once again, you once once everything is done, check your gaps, flexion extension gap. If both are good, uh, follow the 10 commandments. 10 commandments will be dealt with the next class. Then your surgery is done. The gap balancing is the other way of doing the TKR, which is tibia first. And the, the exploration is completely based on tibia. So that uh, I think Dr. Atnagar will be telling a video class on that and BP instrumentation. So I haven't discussed that. And coming to the last step or the first step in your surgery is the patelloplasty. We don't do resurfacing at our institute. So I'll be talking about only patelloplasty. Is that just making the patella as a nice and rounded hemisphere or a small knob. Make sure after cutting everything, your patella should be at least 18 to 23 mm of patella should be left. Otherwise, it can lead to a fracture. So this is today's case. I just want to show you the pictures here. This is the patella. I avoid patella only while doing the pat this one, uh, patelloplasty. So these are osteophytes. First, remove osteophytes with the help of a nebula. And then, uh, this is my way of doing the patella. Then address the lateral facet. Then address the medial facet. Then the inferior part and the superior part. Finally, you'll end up with the patella like this. And there's a circumneurectomy I have done to decrease the anterior knee pain. Sometimes if you have a thick patella, if you think uh, that it's too tight any if you have upsized to avoid the stuffiness you have to debug the patella more yeah thank you thank you kishore good class explained everything covered all topics yes ma'am so are the concepts clear what all the ones that we've explained today the exposure, yes, sir. Yes. referencing systems, what errors which are commonly done, yes, and how to avoid them. Yeah. What uh, rotation you can normally keep, sir, in various knee? What so, rotation? Uh, if you look at the or? relation, if you look at the relationship between PCA to TEA, on an average, it's around three degrees. Three degrees. So usually we have power between three to four point five. Remember, as you increase your uh, rotation, the amount of bone you're removing from the posterior medial aspect of the femur keeps increasing, which is not good. You tend to give uh, and take more bone and give more rotation in a 
uh, CR knee when you're sparing the PCL. But if you're removing the PCL, it is uh, you make sure that you give don't don't give too much rotation because you just open up your flexion gap too much on the medial side. So on an average, it's around three to four point five degrees. In so many companies, they have uh, special rotations like three degrees, say, six degrees, four degrees is there. You can go up to 4.5, not six degrees. In PFC, there is only three degrees of rotation. Any other questions? Um, yeah, so please explain uh, the reason behind you said uh, in CR knee, there is more tibial slope, maybe six to seven, you said, and then in yes. PS knees, what is the biomechanics behind? So, because of uh, the rollback, uh, if you look at the native uh, tibia, on an average, uh, in Indian knees, the slope is more. Around up to 10 degrees also, Seven we see 10. a lot of slope. So, for the rollback to happen properly and to have no lift off of the poly, you need to match the native slope of the tibia for a CR knee because that is how it is designed. So, by giving more slope, and giving little more external rotation, you're creating that flexion gap while your PCL is trying to hold on to your femur. So if you don't give more slope, uh, you will have uh, the lift off and then uh, the femur will, will really roll back on your tibia. And this is how the position will be when you trial them. There'll be a lot of anterior gap. So to avoid that, in usually in CR knees, we give little more slope than a PS knee. In a PS knee, there is no uh, PCL. And there is no rollback. The flexion happens when the when the post hits the cam, and then you have flexion. In CR knee, the flexion is based on how the rollback happens. So that's the reason you have more slope in CR knees as compared to PS, where it is zero to three. Yes. Uh, sir, you told uh, you should make sure that uh, in distal femur cut. Uh, the cut should not go into flexion and extension. How do you make sure and how do you know that inadvertently you have cut the uh, distal femur in flexion or extension? Yeah, you won't know. So it's the as uh, if this is the femur, uh, how the jig enters is very crucial, right? This is anterior, this is posterior. So if your jig is uh, sitting right flush uh, as you actually put your pins, so if you are cutting like this, then you're extending your femur, right? It's digging in. If you're cutting like this, you're flexing. So as you enter and when you put that intramedullary rod, you have to make sure that that first thing that the hole should not be too big. It should be just enough for your, for your intramedullary guide to go in and then don't move it up or down. All said and done in, in manual TK, your at best 60% accurate, right? So some amount of discrepancy can happen. A little bit of maybe two to three degrees of variation can happen. So uh, you have to be mindful of that and try to, as the draw, as the intramedial rod goes in, you have to make sure that you don't lift your hand or depress it too much because that will put the jig in the wrong position. Especially young surgeons, they lift their hands sometimes. They will go in a flying mode or they will go in a landing mode. That makes the difference. You have to go in a neutral mode in the slot properly. And when you are cutting also, you must see how much you are cutting. That's so why I have said that once you are going, starting to cut your distal femur, Start in the center, mark the cut on both sides, then go. Then that will avoid the problem. Generally, the present jigs, the old jigs will have the uh, play and the uh, type of saw blade you are using. If it's malleable, then there's so the more is, chances yeah. of uh, going more or less. But you have a so two-piece the... striker blade, then the cut would be generally more better. Yeah, so this is the second part of the error. So what I mentioned is even before this step, how to mount the jig. the jig. So after mounting the jig properly also, you can create an error. So if you have 1.2 or 2 mm blade thickness, 
which are the thicker blades then your toggle is less yeah. so there is less chances of uh, creating error but most of our blades i think the ones that we use are i think uh, 0.8 to 1 mm 0.8 0.8 yeah, which are 0. more 8. flexible yes well is uh, one if you are <coughs> if you have taken a by mistake uh, the distal femur cut in a slight flexion is it acceptable like 2 to 3 degrees so it is not your eye can't discern and something like that right uh, you can only make a judgment of whether you've taken too much of cut or not okay sometimes it uh, may not anteriorly so when what you have to do is in yeah what you have to do is uh, put your jig back on um, if you have pushed your hand down that's when you will cut in flexion right so try to put the jig back and try to take off the anterior chamfer a little bit of the anterior side if you can but no big deal uh, if slightly little more flexion is always okay the extension is the problem so, because uh, it will dig into the anterior aspect of the femur so one more doubt while we are placing the tbr jig uh, while we are referencing it extra articularly uh the distal portion of the tibia jig should be in the center of the ankle yes that is, uh, but so in some books where uh, i have read in that uh, roberto rosso by soft tissue balancing in tkr he advises to keep it 2 3 to 4 mm medially while taking a cut he, his reason is that the distal femur is only 87 degree so to get the 3 mm 3 degree perfect cut we need to keep it 3 Yeah, ma'am. Immediately to get ninety degrees cut. What is your thought on that, sir? No, I think uh, again that accuracy you can never get in manual surgery. Always remember when you're doing manual TK, you are plus minus three degrees already, right? So if you're matching the medial aspect of uh, the tuberosity and the center of the ankle. you try to if you are aiming at 90 you might be 92 or 87 remember that so you can't aim at 87 that's the whole reason why uh, the whole surgery moved to mechanical in 1980s and 90s because uh, at best you can create a 90 degree cut so trying to simulate an 87 degree cut is just impossible and you should not attempt so try staying on the ankle and the medial tuberosity so that at least if you are aiming at 90 degree cut maybe you are 91 degrees or 87 or 80 88 one of the ways uh, people used to identify the center of the ankle as i was telling under the cm they used to mark it keep an ecg lead and then it but even in spite of that the sir was saying there will be there but that's what people some people in mumbai follow that so we are really fixated on on alignment right but for a successful tk balance is also yes. equally maybe little more important you might be a few degrees off in terms of your flexion of the femur in terms of your varus valgus cut on the tibia never stay varus uh, valgus you can be little varus not a big deal but what is in your hands and what you should achieve what we will explain in the future classes is how to attain good balance that is probably more crucial for longevity of your uh, implant and success of your tka more than alignment in this class i have just taken the basic steps because varus and valgus yeah. there will be in detail explanation is just the order of cuts and what to be seen is what is explained with each ever severe deformity varus valgus f15 everything will be explained again in detail f15 recurvatum varus valgus separate classes are there Uh, one more doubt. Can we have? Suppose a... we have taken. Suppose we have taken a cut in the uh, proximal tibia uh, uh, using an extra medullary jig, and we found that the cut is slightly in the varus. And um, how to remedy that situation? Keep a saw blade for the cut and realign the jig and cut it again. Varus means you are cutting medially more. Align yes, the jig again. Align the jig again, and uh, okay. keep your bony alignments. Keep a saw blade for the cut through the jig, and put the pins again and cut laterally. 
after cutting again you can check even before putting the pins also every system they have alignment rods you can keep alignment rod before putting pins also you can check whether your cut is good or not whether you are properly aligning or not you have to check you can before putting pins also you can align ah uh, i am been using so, that uh, smith and nephew genesis 2 system and uh, whenever i take a cut in a neutral portion i think i am in always in varus mm. so i started using 3 to 4 mm medially and i find it useful for me uh, yeah that's the easier way possible. of doing it that's the easier way of doing it so put it at mm. 90 in the center and cut if you end up your pins are already there right if you feel you uh, you you have a varus cut slightly move the jig the lower part of the jig medial and uh, shave off the lateral side so that's perfectly fine what you're doing is absolutely fine absolutely because fine. removing all the pins checking putting the jig back is a hassle keep your pins see confirm your cut if you are in varus slightly move the jig mount the jig back slightly move it more medial and take the lateral side the protocol is for taking uh, free hand which is not recommended unless you have little experience make sure your blade is flush with the medial condyle and then start cutting go into the lateral don't just start on the lateral side keep flush your blade on the medial and then go lateral so that usually then that usually side specific jigs usually it is easy the cut will be perpendicular so yeah. for you to yeah, know whether you possible, cut in varus yeah we'll probably uh, take a video and show you yeah uh, if your jig if your leg is more medial and your your drop rod is more lateral then that's a varus cut that is because varus. your drop rod is lateral you have to cut more on the lateral side wherever it Can goes you, uh, you have to cut that side yes ma'am ma we'll take if it is uh, possible we'll, can think, you please show us a video using that uh, yeah uh, that technique yeah, so you are using i think using we'll we will show you a video of how to dislocate and then one how to adjust for your varus cut okay how much how much varus should be acceptable so in this up to up to 3 degrees is fine sir uh no, the range is huge it's it's a surgeon's preference but if your overall hk axis is within 3 degrees you are probably in the most safest spot uh but uh, surgeons have deviated from that overall hk axis of even 5 is accepted now but a varus cut of 3 degrees up to 3 degrees is is fine i think 100 out of 100 surgeons would say yes to that targeting in a in a conventional way targeting 3 degrees is not right you can accept 3 degrees you can't uh, accept one more thing while we are marking the transepicondylar axis uh sometime manually uh we are not able to find the correct uh, line uh it can be a little yeah. bit up and down so is there any trick where we can have it an exact so, ea so exactly is not possible not reliable you can so keep a auto to or that you can mark with the cautery transepicondylar axis yes so the While question is it, how to find the Yeah, so I'll uh, I'll answer. Right? So usually it's covered with a lot of soft tissue. So what I usually do is use a nibbler, and then where you have the epicondyle, slightly remove the synovium on top. Okay, then it becomes little more prominent among the medial and the lateral. The lateral is more difficult to actually palpate because it is uh, very thin. uh and the soft tissue cover is also there's a lot of tension on it so medial is much easier so use a nibbler just take out little bit of tissue on top feel for it and then make a mark using the cautery on the corresponding part of the femur on the lateral side again you'll need little more exposure and then use the use the nibbler open up that side slightly and then feel for it and then make your mark and like how ma'am said then use your osteotome to make that line we've done a study to see the accuracy of uh, manual uh, registration versus robotic the error is huge you are almost uh, 7 degrees internal rotation to 8 degrees of external rotation when you manually actually check 
so there is some amount of error there is no doubt about it that is one of the biggest disadvantages of ta uh, measurement versus uh, white sites Right. Are we done with the doubts and questions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. We'll call it today. Yeah, ten thirty. Yeah, I think. Yeah. Okay. Okay. React to participation from everyone. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Just one thing. Uh, whatever we heard in the class was uh, very good, but uh, can we have some video demonstration? Like, yeah, yeah. Because that Thank you you told medial and lateral triangle that uh, you are practicing in your institute. What is the distal and medial extent and distal and lateral extent of the triangles that you are for the TBI, anterior TBI uh, exposure? Yes, next okay. actually we have a video demonstration of that. Sure. And specifically really now uh, we will uh, give you videos as requested by you. One is the virus correction. And this also will be able to give a small thing next time. And this, yeah, so, so I'll show both videos, how to dislocate yeah. the tibia and how to. Yeah, Ransal and uh, this thing. And how yeah. to take uh, that MCL release and the lateral one and the meniscus and how to go. it out. That will also will be told. The video's buffering mm -hmm. is not good, uh, at least from me. That's why I kept the pictures continuous, successive pictures. We'll do, so we'll show that in next class. The TBL alignment also, the TBL virus. Yes, virus everything, everything. Yeah. Will be so shown. We'll, sh we'll show you both. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Thanks sir, a lot, sir. With your Thank background, you. uh, sir, with your background, uh, like checks, with your experience along with the video can it would be better yeah so as i said for every step there are three ways to check any step yeah. you take so everyone everything will be told uh, and uh, we'll we'll give away your demonstration also on that yeah thank you sir. thank you sir thank yeah. you thank you sir. okay bye guys thank you thank you sir yeah. thank you sir thank, thank you, you sir. everyone for the patient listening yeah. we'll meet in the next class thank okay. you Tarun? No, yeah, no. Ah, you didn't listen. Good night. Ah, good night. Mm -hmm. Hello?